Hi everyone, I'm Molly with the University of Nebraska State Museum and welcome to Science Cafe. For those of you who are attending our program for the first time, Science Cafe is a casual evening of social science, so feel free to grab a drink, uh, bring some food, and get comfortable. We typically host this monthly program at the Happy Raven, but we're glad that so many people are still tuning in virtually. The Happy Raven is still open for pickup sales, so hopefully you had a chance to visit them tonight, or you can head over there to pick up drinks in, on another evening uh, soon. So we're broadcasting tonight's program through Zoom and Facebook Live, so we have a few quick reminders to help you enjoy the program. We'll be taking questions at the end of the presentation, so if you think of a question during the presentation and don't want to forget it, please feel free to use the chat box in Zoom or the thread below the video on Facebook. We have moderators from Morrill Hall who are monitoring the chat, and I will be able to share your questions at the end of the presentation. And if you're joining on Zoom, please keep your microphones on mute. Uh, make sure that the red slash is going through the microphone icon. And we also recommend that Zoom participants set your screen to presenter view to make sure that you can see our speaker for the duration of the talk. Okay, so for anyone just tuning in, I'm Molly with Morrill Hall, and welcome to Science Cafe. Thank you for joining us today. And I am pleased to introduce Jessica Corman for a presentation on waters around the world. Dr. Corman is an assistant professor in the UNL School of Natural Resources and the Daughtry Water for Food Global Institute faculty fellow. Jessica, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Molly, and thank you for the invitation. I um, am sorry we're not all at Happy Raven, because that would be super fun. But the advantage of doing it this way is that I know I have some friends and family from out of state that have been able to join. And so that's pretty special. Um, and for all of you in Lincoln, thank you so much for sitting at your computer for a little bit longer. The rain seems to have finally stopped. So I know that is a somewhat big sacrifice, but hopefully you can get out and enjoy nice weather tomorrow. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna jump in and talk a little bit about some of the projects that I've worked on, why I think lakes are really great, and why, um, or some different ways that I hope that um, you all can be involved with the lakes and streams around you. And so, yeah, I'm a professor of limnology here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, if you have any questions for me after and you don't want to ask on the chat, feel free to shoot me an email um, or you can follow me on Twitter and send me a message through there as well. Um, and this background picture that is behind me, so this is Luna Lake, one of the lakes that I worked on in northern Wisconsin. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about Wisconsin lakes, but not a whole lot. And then the picture on this slide is from a lake I worked on in Guatemala, Lake Atitlan, um, which I also won't be talking a ton about, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions about it if you have them. So what is a limnologist? Well, um, a limnologist, that's how you pronounce it, a limnologist, you can all say it. If we were at the bar, this would work much better, um, but I thank you all for humoring that for a moment. So. A limnologist is someone that studies inland waters. So lakes, streams, even wetlands, sometimes groundwaters, but we tend to look at these surface waters in terms of their ecology, biology, geology, and physics. And we wrap around those, all those very different interdisciplinary studies to understand these aquatic ecosystems. And these aquatic ecosystems are really important for a number of reasons. Um, one, they are a great place to go hiking, right? So here I am with my dog, who, again, if we were at Happy Raven, you would probably get a chance to meet um, lovely Hunter. He's sorry that he is not getting a chance to meet you all, um, but perhaps another day. But yeah, lakes can be a great place to go hiking. They can be a great place to sit back and relax and enjoy a beverage, watch the sunset, hang out on your sailboat. Um, obviously this was taken not in current conditions, so please socially distance if you're out near waters. Um, lakes are also in the winter time can be a lovely place to recreate. You can go cross country skiing, ice fishing, um, and yeah, have just a wonderful time and experience those lakes in a very different way than you can in the summer. Um, lakes are also great for, you know, canoeing and backpacking, um, portaging trips, and of course, fishing. I am um, 
embarrassingly not much of a fisher myself, but um, I know lots of folks are and uh, the lakes up in northern Wisconsin can be great spots to catch a muskie or some walleye and whatnot. Um, and then of course, you know, just great places to relax, do a bit of yoga, if you will, or go swimming. And of course, lakes are also just really important as natural resources, right? So this is Lake Victoria in Kenya where I've done some work and here is a woman washing her dishes in the lake. Um, some lakes and streams serve as drinking water sources, as fish sources for food. Um, they can be important for navigation, irrigation, industry, and again, recreation and biodiversity. Um, another fun fact, ice used to be um, cut up or carved out from lakes and uh, from northern climates and brought down to southern climates to keep food cold. But understanding these lake ecosystems can be important for anything from recreational value to industry to people's everyday livelihoods. So where is the water on earth? Um, when you think about water on earth, you probably think that a lot of it is in the oceans and that is absolutely right. But what you might not have realized is less than 1% of the earth's water is found in lakes and rivers, right? So when we think about all of these different reasons that lakes are important, um, and it represents just a tiny fraction of water on earth, it really sort of drives home how precious these resources are. Um, and I also just wanted to point out that like even when we think about where the water is in lakes, they're just in a few lakes, right? So if we, if we count up salt lake water and freshwater lakes, um, the Caspian Sea, Lake Baikal, and Lake Tanganyika count for about three quarters of the non-oceanic water on Earth, right? Just three bodies of water. Um, and if we just look at freshwater lakes, you know, it's Lake Baikal and Lake Tanganyika have almost 40% of the water. Um, on Earth, Lake Superior, which we think of as a really big lake in the States, right, accounts for about, you know, 12% of that um, or less. And so all of these other lakes that we venture to are just such a tiny fraction of, of the water on Earth. And really a lot of that fresh water is sequestered in those two lakes. And because it's kind of fun to know some trivia facts about lakes. So Lake Baikal is in Russia. Um, it is the world's largest lake. It's also the world's deepest lake at 1.64 kilometers or about 5,387 meters deep, right? Hugely deep lake. Compared to the oceans, right? Not, not so deep, um, but it is a hugely deep lake. Um, it's also been claimed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. One thing that I think is really cool about Lake Baikal is there are actually freshwater seals that live in this lake, right? So seals aren't just in the ocean, they're also in Lake Baikal, um, and there's tons of other amazing plants and animals that live in Lake Baikal. Um, it's this really old lake, it's been around, they think, we think between 25 to 30 million years, so there's been a lot of interesting evolutionary processes that have happened in that lake. Um, that have led to really unique biodiversity of that, of that system. And so if you only know two lakes, the names of two lakes in the world, the first one is Lake Baikal, and then the second one is Lake Tanganyika. So Lake Tanganyika holds about 18% of the world's fresh water. It's found in East Africa, bordered by Tanzania, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, Zambia and Burundi. And um, it's famous for a lot of its cichlids, right? You can get freshwater cichlids from, uh, you can find freshwater cichlids in a lot of aquarium stores. People have them as pets. But Lake Tanganyika is also a really important regional fishery. About 40% of the protein that's consumed in Tanzania comes from Lake Tanganyika. It's a hugely important food source to that region. Um, and the other fun fact about Lake Tanganyika is there are freshwater jellyfish there. Um, I was fortunate enough to uh, swim around in Lake Tanganyika when I was an undergrad and there I got to see freshwater jellyfish and I didn't know that there were freshwater jellyfish in this lake when I was snorkeling around and so it was just like this crazy experience. I'm like collecting my water samples and things like that and then all of a sudden I see this like little jellyfish and I'm like am I in the right body of water? Have I gone to the ocean? But sure enough there are freshwater jellyfish in Lake Tanganyika and actually in other lakes around the world too, if you're lucky enough to 
find them, although they are generally pretty locally kept secrets, as it were. Um, so there, those are my two uh, lakes for you to know, Lake Baikal and Lake Tanganyika. We're at Happy Raven. There'd probably be some trivia, so maybe if I come back in a couple years um, and you come back to the talk, you will know my trivia answers. But um, yeah, so inland waters are amazing, precious resources. And a quick interlude before I jump into the science. So here's a question. What does beer have to do with limnology? Cheers to everyone. Um, hopefully you have a tasty beverage with you as well. And so you might be thinking, well, both have water. That's true. Um, Beer also has some other things in it. And what's interesting is that these beers, right, have a stained coloration to them. It turns out that not all lakes are blue or green, but some of them are actually brown too, a lot like the beer that we drink. So while in nature these come from tannins and things like that, um, in the beer it comes from like the hops and plant materials that we use to make our beer. And so when you are out exploring, looking at different lakes and you see a brown colored waters, um, you can think of, you know, does it look like a pale ale? Does it look like a Guinness? Whatever it may be. Um, but it's also really fun when you're doing tastings of beer to think of uh, your favorite lakes that you have seen that might be also color stained. Um, at least it is a great excuse for limnologists to try a bunch of beer types to see um, which one might be most emblematic of the different waters that we've studied. All right, so the first topic that I'm going to talk about today is limnology and the evolution of life. So stromatolites. Uh, stromatolites have existed about 3.5 billion years of Earth's history, right? And there are these fossilized rocks, um, you can hopefully see my pointer on the screen, that uh, were formed by some of the first microbial communities on Earth. So they've been around for a super, super long time. And generally, they're thought to only exist in oceanic systems. Um, but a little bit more about that later. And they were around for, you know, over 80% of Earth's history, right? So if we understand stromatolites, we can understand a lot about the history of Earth and how life evolved into the myriad diversity of organisms that we see today. Um, so there's been a lot of research comparing and contrasting living forms of these stromatolites, the most famous being those in Sharps Bay, Australia, and the fossil and mineralized forms. But lucky for me, not all fossilized stromatolite-like things or actual stromatolites are found in oceanic systems. So we're gonna jump to the Valley of Cuatro Cienegas, northern Mexico, um, in the middle of the uh, Coahuila Desert, or the Chihuahuan Desert in the state of Coahuila, and um, dive into Rio Mesquites. So here I am snorkeling, looking at the beautiful river, where deep inside, or at the bottom of that river, we find more stromatolites. Except what's really cool about the stromatolites here, that they're kind of in the shape of little golf balls. Um, they come in different sizes. Some are sort of small as golf balls, some are as big as footballs. They have some different coloration to them, but they are a wonderful um, an ant analog to the fossilized stromatolites that we found at Sharks Bay. But what's even better about these ones is that you can pick them up and hold them in your hand, which makes it really convenient to do experimental work with them. So what can Ria Mesquites tell us about the evolution of life? So here's that river that uh, we find these oncolites or stromatolites in. So a little bit of background into how these organisms form or these um, microbial communities form. So it's this combination of mineral and um, living material. Um, you can sort of think, in, think of it as a bunch of different cake layers, right? So you have your like the sponge and then you have the frosting and then more sponge and more frosting. Um, 
and that mimics how you have the minerals and then some uh, microbial material, minerals, and then living material um, throughout uh, these microbial, um, microbial lights or stromatolites. So what drives this process, at least in this system, is what's called the alkalinity engine. And I know this is horrible to put up a chemical um, slide, and so you can completely ignore it. And the take home here is that when those microbes, they're respiring a lot or they're eating a lot, they're basically dissolving that mineral material. But when they're photosynthesizing a lot, when they're growing, right, like plants do, um, they're promoting that mineralization, right? So the more photosynthesis you have, the more mineral growth you have. So this all seems well and good, right? So they're making some minerals as the microbes are growing, no big deal, right? Except when calcium carbonate forms and there's phosphorus around, it can suck up that phosphorus. So you get phosphorus absorption into the minerals or incorporation into the minerals, kind of some nitty gritty of the geochemistry. Um, this process I just generally refer to as co-precipitation and it basically means that that phosphate, that phosphorus is locked into that mineral structure, potentially making it really hard for those microbes to get access to it, right? Um, so when calcium carbonate forms, I can take up phosphorus. So what does this mean? Well, these stromatolites grow by forming calcium carbonate, right? Calcium carbonate takes up phosphorus, and this is perhaps problematic because microbes also need phosphorus. So um, a joke I like to say is I like phosphorus because it's in my genes right, DNA in my genes, there's phosphorus in your DNA, the phosphate uh, background of um, every DNA molecule, RNA as well. Um, it's also in our cell walls, so the phospholipid membrane. Perhaps you remember um, ATP, adenotriphosphate, uh, adenosine triphosphate, the energy molecule um, in our cells, right, so every living thing needs phosphorus. So, if the phosphorus that you need is being taken up by the calcium carbonate, that could potentially lead to some inter interesting constraints on those microbes. So this led to my research question of, you know, how do these microbes build stromatolites um, when the, by the very process of building that mineral material, they're potentially reducing the availability of one of the minerals that they need or one of the nutrients that they need to grow. So this question drove a lot of my uh, dissertation research. Um, and I just wanna give a shout out to funders. Um, this uh, project was funded by a bunch of different people, a bunch of different organizations, the National Science Foundation, NASA, the American Philosophical Society, Science Foundation Arizona, and the ARCS or the Advancing um, Science in America uh, Institute, and it was conducted while I was at Arizona State University, which was also um, gave a lot of support for the projects. So anyway, as I mentioned before, what was great about these oncolites, these stromatolites, is that you could pick them up and put them into buckets and do some experimental work and start diving into this question of this potential paradox between where's the calcium carbonate, um, or where's the phosphorus, can the microbes get it, are they limited by the amount of phosphorus? Um, and could that potentially be an important thing to think about when we think about the evolution of um, these microbial communities throughout time? And so we discovered a bunch of things um, through this work. One is that these oncoid associated microbes grew faster when we gave them phosphorus. So when we, phosphor uh, when we fertilize these microbial communities with phosphorus, they grew more. When we took microbial communities from the river that weren't associated with those oncoids or stromatolites, they didn't respond to that phosphorus. So it certainly suggests that this idea that the um, co-precipitation of phosphate with the calcium carbonate is limiting access to phosphorus to those microbes. And then the next thing that we did, um, we came up with a couple of clever ways to reduce calcium carbonate deposition rates um, to the oncoids. So we slowed down the mineral formation, um, but let them still grow. The microbes are able to access a lot more phosphorus and incorporate that phosphorus into their biomass. 
suggesting again that the um, that there is this apparent potential competition between their growth and phosphorus availability. So these insights suggest that early stromatolite microbes may have faced interesting challenges to accessing phosphorus from calcium carbonate. And this research is really just scratching the surface on um, what's happening here. But what's been really cool is that since this work has been done for the past few years, um, some other researchers have picked it up and have really glommed onto this idea that calcium carbonate formation um, has been a really important limiting, um, a really important aspect of uh, phosphorus cycling in these early ecosystems. And sort of a flip way to think about this too is that calcium carbonate is binding that phosphorus, right? So if microbes are actually able to come up with a way to access that phosphorus in the mineral matrix, it might not actually be a permanent sink to that phosphorus and that formation of the mineral might actually help those microbes grow. So that's kind of where the next step of this research is going um, and could lead to some really exciting insights on um, how these microbial communities formed um, both in the past and today. And so we're gonna jump to the next part of the world um, where I'm gonna talk a little bit about some limnology, um, some extreme limnology and volcanoes. And I'll give you all a sec to um, move away from the desert and into the mountains, into Northern Patagonia, into Mariloche. So because we're in this COVID-19 world, and uh, we're perhaps not traveling to places that we used to travel, I thought I'd go ahead and throw in a couple great things so you can pretend that you are for a moment in Bariloche. Um, so Bariloche is famous for its ice cream, the Alato. Um, it's wonderful there. Uh, it's also famous for its chocolate, chocolate and Rama. And I can't mention Argentina without mentioning steak. Although being in Nebraska, maybe this is blasphemous to say that there is good steak somewhere else in the world. But there is, and it's in Argentina. And of course, why I like uh, Argentina and Northern Patagonia is there are beautiful lakes there. So Lago Nahuapi, just absolutely amazing um, mountain lakes in this region. And so um, before I get into this project, I need to talk a bit more about some basic limnology, right? So I talked a little bit about phosphorus in that last slide, so it's really important. Nutrients in general are really important when they're in an ecosystem, right? We tend to like when we have nutrients in our fields because we use them to promote growth of corn or soybean or oats, wheat, whatever. Um, but we don't tend to like them when they get in our lakes, right? Because sometimes they can promote the growth of noxious algae or phytoplankton or things like that um, and basically turn waters green. So understanding the balance of nutrients can really help us understand whether a lake is gonna be that beautiful crystal clear waters like we see there with Lago Nahuapi, or if it's gonna be this more like pea soup green waters, like this is the edge of like Mendota in Wisconsin, um, which certainly receives a lot of nutrients from um, the upland farm areas. So back to Bariloche in Argentina. And on June 4th in 2011, there was an explosive eruption of the Fuerje Cordon Calle Volcanic Complex in Chile, which uh, borders right next to Argentina. It spewed ash 15 kilometers high, nine miles high. Um, pumice traveled as far as 100 kilometers. Um, so about, oh, I'm not going to do that math right in my head to convert that to miles right now. Um, and yeah, it was a very um, large eruption. Um, explosive eruption, so not as much lava, but a lot of ash and pumice spewed out of the volcano. Um, fortunately, there was no loss of life, but there were um, quite detrimental effects to the sheep in the area. I think it was something like 75,000 sheep suffered. 
Um, and they suffered because there was so much ash that kind of fell into the sheep's wool. It's really sort of sad. It kind of like all caked into the wool and then the sheep's couldn't move around. So they were kind of stuck and then some of them sort of apparently just died in the fields because they were so heavy with the blankets of ash on them. Um, so super sad, but thank goodness no um, human lives were um, uh, lost to the volcano. Um, but because this volcano spewed a bunch of ash and pumice into these lakes, it sort of presented an interesting natural experiment, right? So the pumice coming from the volcano is going to be sterile. It has to be sterile, right? It's coming out super high temperatures. There's nothing that is going to be living um, on that pumice. And so it lands into these lakes and presents a novel habitat, potentially, to these waters, um, the ash potentially starts shading these waters, right? Um, and the other thing to remember here too, right? Pumice floats. It's a rock, but it floats. It has a very high porosity. Um, so even though it's falling on these lakes and it's a rock, it's not gonna sink to the bottom. It's gonna stay on the surface for quite a while. And you can see that in the panel B and C, where in panel B, you have the lake and you see those swirls there. That's actually swirls of pumice um, on the lake. So there we go, some nice swirls of pumice. And then down here in C, this is not a sandy beach. This is actually pumice floating out the water, um, being moved around by one of the waves there. So um, really interesting experiment of just, you know, what happens? And I will tell you. So. Um, I was quite lucky here in that my PhD advisor uh, was on sabbatical in Argentina uh, just before this um, volcano happened and was able to convince NASA that this would be a really interesting project to look at um, how microbial life colonizes new habitat. And so he flew me down to work on the project. Um, and as you see, it was a really really tough experience having to um, sit on beautiful lakes and sample them. I'm kidding. I hope you're laughing. Um, and I like to also say that like in science we do lots of hard work and we have to come up with new skills all the time. And the skill that I gained on this trip was that I had to learn how to drive stick. There are no um, automatic transmission vehicles in Argentina, at least not at the time that we were there. And so it was pretty much like here's the car, and my um, advisor was going off to do some backpacking shortly after I got there, and so I had to very quickly learn how to drive stick, and I somehow managed, um, though I'm not sure I should be allowed to do it uh, anymore. Anyway, so um, going around to the different lakes, pumice, pumice everywhere, right? So here's some pictures of some local fauna in the region checking out the pumice. Um, and there is a beach where the pumice is extending out even beyond the pier. Um, just really incredible densities. And this is several months after that volcano, right? So the volcano hit in June and this is in February. So even, you know, eight months later, there's still a lot of pumice floating around these lakes. So we worked with a team of Argentinian and American scientists. Uh, there's a photo of our group to start asking these questions. Um, and fortunately, because Argentinians were down there when this happened, they took a lot of the initial samples that I'll talk about um, and then helped us out with the rest of the project. So the first question, you know, is what lives in the water and what lives on the pumice? Did, you, did this pumice actually provide a novel habitat or was it just a matter of sorting out and, you know, the same microbes that we see in the pumice are the same microbes that we see in the water? sort of challenging that initial assumption that this is actually a novel habitat. So we collected uh, pumice after um, the eruption in several different time points. We sampled two of the lakes that were really heavily covered with the pumice. Um, this is one of them, Lake Espejo, where you can see uh, one of the scientists who's out quite a ways, um, standing up to about his thighs, collecting water and just you know complete coverage of pumice on this lake. And um, then we extracted the DNA from the pumice in the water and we looked at the 16S ribosomal RNA sequences, which is just basically a fancy way to say 
we uh, figured out what microbes were living on the pumice and the water. And so what we found is that there were distinct communities between the water and the pumice, and that there were communities that were represented in the water that weren't on the pumice and vice versa. So there was this interesting sorting of uh, microbes in those two systems and really suggesting that yes, this pumice did provide a novel habitat um, to new organisms in that system. And so there are about a hundred specific genera found on the water system. So genera being um, uh, genus, right? Genus and species. Um, so a hundred different specific genera and a lot of cyanobacteria and algae. So photosynthesizing organisms are found in the water and another 69 genera specific to the pumice. And what was really interesting, right, is that there were few photosynthetic microbes found on the pumice. This might scratch, make you scratch your head a little bit, right, because the pumice is floating on the surface of the water, yet there were few photosynthetic microbes living on that pumice come back to that in a minute, but something to, to ponder for a bit. Um, but the other kind of cool things about the microbes that we found in the pumice were that these are really sort of diverse microbes. Um, there are ones that liked living on benthic surfaces or particles, right? They didn't like being suspended in water. Um, there were microbes that lived off of different types of energy supplies, right? Some that lived off of iron. And we found microbes that really required high oxygen levels, um, higher than might be found dissolved in the water. So it was a really unique consortia um, on the pumice compared to the water. And so the photosynthetic microbes are dominating the water samples. And then there are these biogemically complex microbial communities on the pumice. Pretty cool. And weirdly, right, no photosynthetic or few photosynthetic microbes living on the pumice. Um, so then there was the question too, it's like, okay, so we know the players are different, the organisms are different on the pumice than in the water, but what does this mean to the lake ecosystems themselves? So Patagonia and lakes are generally low in nutrients, but high in light. Volcanic input of pumice and ash can add phosphorus, right, there's a lot of phosphorus in that rock, not nitrogen, just phosphorus, um, but it could also decrease the light, right, because that pumice floats and the ash is going to float around in the water too. So we first wanted to look at how the nutrient cycling might change, right? So we added a bunch of pumice to it. We expected an infusion of phosphorus into that water, but on the flip side, we also added a whole bunch of new habitat to that lake. So did that new habitat represent a net um, sink of phosphorus or a net supply of phosphorus, right? So if the pumice just brought phosphorus to the water and fertilized it, then it would be a supply of phosphorus. But if the microbes living on that pumice are growing enough and demand enough phosphorus, they might actually be a sink of phosphorus in that system. So we had three treatments in this experiment. So those three cylinders represent the three bottles that we used. Um, we had multiple replicates, but the three different treatments, right? And we added filtered lake water to each one. We added sterile pumice to one type, and then we added lake pumice to the other. And then um, in another treatment, we did the same thing, but we also spiked those with nutrients. And so this way we could see if nutrients were leaching out of the pumice or if they were being taken up, what that net balance was. And um, Pretty interestingly, I think, is that we found that even though the phosphorus adds phosphorus to the water, there was enough growth on the, on the pumice that um, those microbes were taking up um, not just that phosphorus that came with the pumice, but also a bunch of phosphorus and nitrogen from the water column itself. Um, and in terms of nitrogen, when we extrapolated this out to the entire lake, making some, you know, conservative assumptions about pumice cover and things like that, um, we suggested that, you know, all of the nitrogen could have been removed by the pumice living on those microbes alone and almost all of the phosphorus as well from the water column. So suggesting that these pumice environments could really, at least temporarily, impact these lake ecosystems and lead to um, a drawdown of nutrients from um, 
water that already doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. So it could be problematic for the rest of the food web. Um, you can make that sort of extrapolation. And then we wanted to look at the phytoplankton a little bit more, right, and see, okay, so um, kind of the flip side of this, the phytoplankton that live in the water, do they benefit at all from this scenario? Are they able to get any of that phosphorus um, or are they being detrimentally affected by light in this system because they're losing light, right? So photosynthesis, you need nutrients, you need light. If you don't have light, if you don't have nutrients, your plants aren't gonna grow. Your phytoplankton, which are the single cellular plants or um, cyanobacteria in your water aren't gonna grow. So for this experiment, again, we set up our bottles um, represented here by the lovely cartoon drawings and we added unfiltered lake water this time, right? Because we wanted to look at those critters that lived in the lake water. And we adjusted the light intensity. So we had 3% of ambient light all the way up to normal light conditions or 100% of ambient light. And then we also wanted to uh, look at the effects of UV light versus just regular light. So we had another treatment where we filtered out UV radiation. And then we looked at phytoplankton biomass as our response, right? So how did these treatments impact the phytoplankton biomass? Um, and sort of layered on top of this too, we had another, you can think of another set of uh, 10 bottles where we had the same light intensity adjustments and UV radiation, but we spiked it with more nutrients. Um, so we were able to compare then the light by UV by uh, nutrient treatment. Um, so kind of a complex experiment that you don't really need to remember the details. Um, hopefully I will walk them through with you enough. So the results here on this lovely graph, and I hate showing graphs, and so I apologize that I'm showing a graph um, I tried to add cartoons to it to make it more bearable. Hopefully it did. So here on the x-axis, we have light intensity, right? So the darker treatments that didn't get a lot of light, and then the 100% light treatment, and then the growth rate of the phytoplankton um, from sort of zero to zero, meaning there was no change in growth. If there's a negative number, that means that they were... Uh, slowing down or dying, right? So we were losing biomass versus a positive number that they were gaining biomass. Um, and so before we look at the differences between the circles and the triangles and the dashes and the lines, well, you might pick up this overall trend, right? Is that when we go from 100% light to no light, we, or 3% light, we increase phytoplankton growth. So losing light helps the phytoplankton. Scratch your head a minute. Yeah, so this is kind of an unexpected result. Um, and it's because these lakes are so high altitude, right? They're just getting pummeled by light. And this process is called inhibition. Um, and it actually makes it really hard for the algae to live really hard for the phytoplankton to live and so oh, look at her background. they have to um, decrease uh, or it ends up decreasing their growth rate for a bit um, and in practical terms in a lake it means that you'll find them lower in the water column where not as much water is breached um, but here we see that it that it um, promotes their growth when we decrease that light similar to what happened with the ash that fell in so on the x-axis, we have this pre-eruption and post-eruption. So the pre-eruption means that this is the light environment of that lake normally. The post-eruption is the light environment after that ash fell in. And so we see a really dramatic um, increase. Actually, I mean, we just see positive growth, right? We shaded the surface of those lakes and it helps the phytoplankton grow. And those differences between the circles and the triangles and the dashed lines um, and the solid lines really are much smaller than that whole entire trend, suggesting that you know this decrease in light causing from ash is the most important thing that helps these phytoplankton. It wasn't any additional phosphorus that was the important thing here. So um, a really kind of an interesting thing that 
probably also suggests that when those microbes on the pumice were taking up the nutrients, the phytoplankton might not have cared so much, at least initially, because um, they were really happy to have lower light conditions where they could grow. So just to sum up what we have learned, one, volcanoes impact lakes. Figuratively, right, and literally, I should say, um, they impact them by dumping a bunch of ash and pumice into them, potentially, but also by having these really interesting intera ecological interactions with the system, right? So pumice provides these novel habitats. That's why NASA was interested in this project, right? Because this could have been a way that, um, also, early microbial communities might have um, lived and had interesting environments that were biogeochemically complex. Um, so it could provide some interesting insights too into uh, the evolution of early microbial communities, just like in that last project. Um, and then, you know, both the ash and the pumice are making these waters more hospitable for microbes, both the phytoplankton and these new microbial communities that live on the, the pumice, and that these have interesting impacts for nutrient cycling too. Of course, the caveat here is how long do these impacts last? Um, from what we've seen in these lakes and what from my bread in other lakes, pumice doesn't stick around forever. It sticks around for maybe a year or two, and eventually you get enough microbial growth on there. Those um, air pockets get filled with water and they eventually become dense enough where they do sink to the bottom of the lake um, and are in the sediments. Which is also kind of an interesting thing too, right? Because you can go back to those lakes and dig up those sediments um, and take a look at how volcanoes could have impacted lakes in the past because it is indeed really hard to get lucky enough for an eruption to happen to study those lakes. All right, um, so I have one more sort of quick little story and some final thoughts, and then we will jump into the Q&A. So final thing, what happens when a lake turns pea soup green? So this is an image of Lake Monona in Wisconsin taken from an airplane. And there's a couple interesting things about this image. One, right, that lovely green swirl in the water, you know, that's a bunch of algae and cyanobacteria. That's a bunch of phytoplankton, right? That's a bunch of microscopic organisms that you can see from a plane. How cool is that, right? There's so much growth of these microscopic organisms that you can see them from a plane. The other cool thing, and I'm imagining you all like nodding your heads, really excited about that fact right now. Um, so the other really cool thing too, right, is that there is so much of this growth of these microscopic organisms, these phytoplankton, like they mimic the trees on the landscape right nearby. Right? And we think of these trees as like super important plants and producers. But yes, these phytoplankton are super important producers as well in the system. Um, but the story of the piece of green, right, is that all great. Um, so recall, right, we like nutrients in our fields because they help plants grow, but when they get in the waters, they help the phytoplankton grow, which may not be such a great thing, right? And this um, enrichment of our waters is called eutrophication, and it can be really problematic right? Because, you know, for one, we tend to not like waters that we can't see, right? We like our clear waters. We have a cultural um, sort of desire to be near clearer waters. There's actually studies that show how housing prices um, reflect water quality of a nearby lake, things like that. Um, and so there's sort of that like aesthetic value, but there's also very real um, human health implications too. So um, a couple years ago, right, uh, swimming was closed at Branch Duck and Pawnee Lakes, which are local lakes here um, in Lancaster County in Nebraska because of um, toxic cyanobacteria there. Um, Toledo had a water crisis a few years ago, you might have remembered, um, and there were huge and continue to be huge toxic cyanobacterial blooms in that region. And unfortunately, Toledo gets its drinking water from the lake, 
that's super problematic because um, it's really hard to get toxins out of water. And so they had to um, use bottled water in that, in that area in Toledo instead. Um, it's caused beach closers. And then um, there's almost every summer, there's a story of a dog dying after swimming in one of these lakes. Um, and so I'm gonna get back to the dog point in a minute, but you've probably seen these headlines, right? And you've probably seen warnings from your local um, health departments or parks that you've been to that have said, you know, beach is closed. And so it's good to scratch your head and ask why. Um, but before I get into this, I also want to point out some jargon. So when people talk about these green gobs of life in our lakes, right, they use a variety of different terms. And when I say people, I mean the media, right? Sometimes they're called blue-green algae. So we see that here um, and this headline here. Um, sometimes it's just called algae. Sometimes it's called deadly algae. Sometimes it's called a harmful algal bloom. Sometimes it's called a cyanohab or a cyanoharmful algal bloom. Um, it's really a cyanobacterial bloom. And it's been kind of mixed up for, you know, a lot of different reasons. But these things are all talking about the same thing. They're talking about a cyanobacteria bloom, most likely. They might be talking about algae, but it's probably a cyanobacteria bloom if it's a toxic issue. So I just want to point that out there. If you're hearing these different terms, they're probably all the same thing. So don't think of them as different. Um, so cyanotoxins are created by the cyano, certain cyanobacteria, and we don't really know why cyanobacteria create these toxic substances. Um, they're called microcystins or um, anatoxins. There's a bunch of different types. Um, but there are these compounds created by these cyanobacteria that have harmful effects on a lot of eukaryotes, which we are, so a lot of humans, wildlife, livestock, um, pets. And as far as we know, there's no real direct reason why uh, the, the cyanobacteria aren't doing it to protect themselves from humans or wildlife or livestock or pets, right? It's just um, an unfortunate thing for us or for our pets or for our livestock. Um, and unfortunately, those toxins can cause liver and kidney damage, gastroenteritis, um, muscle pain fever, dermatitis, conjunctivitis, respiratory distress. Um, and they can cause those maladies through a bunch of different transmission factors, right? So if you're swimming in the water, that's likely where you'll get the dermatitis issues, um, skin itch. Or if you accidentally drink some of the water, that could cause some gastrointestinal pains and stomach aches. Um, you can get exposed to the toxins by breathing, right? So on waters, on lakes, waves form and waves can aerosolize some of those toxic compounds. And so if you're near those waters and you're breathing in, you could breathe in that air kind of accidentally um, and have respiratory issues or sort of not feeling well. Um, if you're ever by a lake, and I've experienced this too, if you're ever by a lake that has like the turquoise blue or turquoise green waters um, from a harmful algal bloom and you're not feeling so great, or if it's just like super green and you're not feeling so great, it gets probably a good indication there are cyanotoxins in that water and maybe that's not the best day to hang out um, by that system. Um, and I'm sure that like, when I talk about aerosolization, right? Like we're sort of all primed for that idea right now because we've been thinking about how, um, how to protect ourselves from respiratory illnesses in the current environment. Um, so yes, it can happen with cyanotoxin as well. Um, and another way, of course, through direct consumption, if you drink the water um, or intravenously hemodialysis, and you might think like, why in the world would anyone pump lake water into um, their, like when they're getting a medical procedure done. And unfortunately there was a case of this in Brazil in a um, dialysis treatment plant where a bunch of um, people were um, 
made seriously ill and or died because of getting cyanotoxins from a dialysis treatment. So it happens, unfortunately, um, and sort of the best thing to do is like to prevent bad water quality, right? Um, because the thing about cyanotoxins is that they're really hard to remove. So a lot of times, like when you think about treating water, one of the basic things we always go back to, right, is boiling the water, and then you can drink it. Throw in some iodine, then you can drink it. Unfortunately, boiling will concentrate cyanotoxins, not remove them, right? So it doesn't break down the toxins, it doesn't break down those molecular compounds, and they're still there. It takes really um, good filtration systems that are expensive to remove those toxic substances, which is why it was cheaper for Toledo to bring in a bunch of bottled water than it was to um, retrofit a water treatment plant in that situation. And so I also wanted to um, talk a little bit about dogs, particularly because dogs when they swim or sort of any animals when they swim in lakes it's not so much from accidentally like lapping up some lake water that they get sick and die from um, it's more from the fact that when they're in the water they have a lot of fur and that fur kind of catches on to a lot of those um, cyanobacteria cells or phytoplankton cells right and then um, animals as they do they're really good at cleaning themselves off and so they lick their fur and they get a really concentrated dosage of the cyanobacteria. And so this summer, if you're out by a lake, right, and you have your dog and it's swimming, that's great and fine, but just give that dog a nice wash down um, after they get out of the lake um, so they don't accidentally consume a bunch of potentially really harmful substances. You don't want to make headlines with your dog this summer. Um, so on that somewhat dreary note, um, lakes are great, right? They are amazing and perhaps now you know a couple different reasons why lakes and streams are both amazing and rivers, so here's the Niagara River, I think perhaps the best river here in Nebraska. Um, and so what can you do, right? Well, one is to continue to educate yourself. So you're here, thank you for listening, thank you for taking some time out of your evening to hear me chat. Um, and there's some other great ways to if you're interested in this topic and want to learn more, um, there are a couple good books, uh, The Death and Life of the Great Lakes by Dan Egan and The Source by Martin Doyle. They're both pretty recent books and just wonderful stories about um, the Great Lakes here in the States and then rivers in the States and how um, you know, society has influenced those systems and how those systems have influenced society and just you know, wonderful stories both really well written, I highly recommend. Um, also get involved with, you know, a conservation organization or, you know, your local kayaking group or whatnot. There's a few names that I threw up there. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to point out is that there is this lovely website that you can go to by the USGS. And there's a USGS site like this for every state. If you type in water data USGS, and whatever state you're in, Nebraska or whatever, um, you'll find a map. And so this is, of course, the state of Nebraska. The gray are a bunch of our streams and rivers. And the circles are where we have stream gauges that are constantly logging in information about that stream. Um, each stream will have, at minimum, the discharge or the water level in that stream. So they're great places to look at flood conditions, right? So the blue means that these streams are like at 90, over 90% 90 of their um, like normal flood conditions, right? So there's really high waters, which makes sense. I downloaded this yesterday. We've had a bunch of days of rain. There's a lot of water in these systems, but it's really wonderful because this information is publicly available to you. Anyone can go on there. You don't need to log in. You don't need to do anything fancy, but you can just go and look at this information. Um, and this is also really great if you're planning a trip to go kayaking or canoeing down a river um, to check out what those conditions are for yourself. And then explore, 
right? Go visit your lakes, go visit your rivers. This is a great thing to do when you're trying to social distance. Being outside is lovely. Um, around Lincoln, we have Holmes Lake, Branch to Oak Lake, Wagon Train. We have a bunch of lovely reservoirs that you can go look at, see, get some time in nature. It's really good for your mental health to just watch the water and sort of soak up that na natural environment. Um, so, you know, take this opportunity while other things are closed to maybe explore a new place or a new park. Um, don't throw Nemo in the water, right? So it's kind of a funny thing, but if you look at the fish that are in lakes and ponds, the closer those lakes and ponds are to a neighborhood, the more likely that lake or pond will have goldfish in it. No, these goldfish are not there naturally, but they're by people throwing in their aquarium organisms, right? So it's probably not a good idea. So maybe don't do that. Um, it also can be a way to spread diseases and things um, out of the natural environment. And along those lines, we've all gotten amazingly good at sterilizing everything. Keep that up in the future. When you move your boat, your kayak, your boots from one body of water to another. Haven't really talked at all today about aquatic invasive species, but they're a huge scourge to um, our water systems and our aquatic environments. And you don't wanna help transport them from one system to another. And so a good way to make sure you don't do that is to clean your gear, sterilize your boat, power wash your boats down between um, visits um, to different lakes. And then finally, right, I've talked a lot about how nutrients are really important in the water. Minimize the nutrient use in your, in your yard, right? Not just um, the nutrients that get into the waters aren't just from agricultural fields, they're also from lawns and wastewater treatment plants and things like that. Um, and pet waste, right? So pick up your pet waste when you take your dog out for a walk. Um, only use what you need for fertilizer and support farmers efforts also to minimize erosion and, and use and fertilizer use. Um, one thing that's really great is the uh, lower flat natural resource district. The South Platt Natural Resource District right has um, funds available in the spring. They've done it for the last couple of years. Hopefully they're gonna continue to do it to help establish rain gardens and things like that in your yard again, to sort of um, minimize water runoff, minimize erosion, keep, keep water moving slowly through the landscape. And then finally, a shout out to um, the cyclists of the world, right? Bike more and drive less. So something you've probably not thought about before, right? But when you drive your car around, um, it's constantly slowly shedding material, right? The tires are wearing down, the brake pads are wearing down, different pieces of that car are wearing down and those heavy metals um, and other compounds eventually get into our water systems. And particularly in urban areas, people have looked and found um, high concentrations or unexpectedly high concentrations of um, basically like dissolved tire components and things like that. Um, near roadways suggesting, you know, that um, cars are not doing great things to these waterways in a really, really unexpected way. Um, so there's tons of reasons that, you know, it's good to bike more or walk more and drive less. Um, but there's another one because it perhaps helps um, keep our waters a bit better. And so with that, I am happy to take some questions. And I can always put those slides back up if I need to, Molly. Oh, good. Well, yeah, thank you so much. And I hope everyone will join me in giving whatever type of virtual round of applause that you can to uh, Jess for the wonderful presentation. I hope you clap, you can just think and think about it to yourself. Um, but uh, thank you so much. Um, and for anyone who has questions, just a reminder, you can put them in the chat box or if you're joining us on Facebook in the thread and I'll share them. And um, the first question uh, that I saw was, um, could you talk a little bit more about how people can remove cytotoxins from the lakes when that's what they depend on for their drinking water? 
Yeah, so there are some recommendations from the World Health Organization and EPA on how to remove the cyanotoxins. And there's a couple um, important steps. And one is sort of doing an initial filtration to remove cells from that water. And so unfortunately that means like more than a cheesecloth or a coffee filter. Like you need a really um, small filter size to get rid of those cells. Um, and then at that point, a combination of um, like UV radiation and chlorine can usually do the trick. Um, but unfortunately, if you skip that filtration step and you just go straight for like the UV or the chlorine, um, which is a really common recommendation because that's good for other things in the water, um, you end up lysing those cells and releasing cyanotoxins that are in the cells. So it increases the cyanotoxins also that way. Um, so it's really that filtration step is the important thing. Um, I've been working on a project in Lake Victoria where we are trying to um, investigate how, so there's a plant that grows in Lake Victoria called water hyacinth, which is an invasive plant. It's not good for a number of reasons, but it might have one benefit, which is it seems to also improve water quality. And we're investigating how that might actually be a way to kind of get around having cyanotoxins in the water because the water hyacinth might either outcompete the phyto or the cyanobacteria or actually take up the cyanotoxins from the water. Um, and so instead of worrying about how to get rid of those cyanotoxins in the water, the recommendation then becomes get your drinking water from parts of the lake where the water hyacinths are instead of where they aren't. Um, but that research is in, is in its preliminary stages, so not quite at the point of um, being able to make recommendations. Thank you. Um, and our next question is, could pumice be used to help clean excess phosphorus from lakes? Well, probably not because the pumice itself, um, so the pumice itself is actually a source of phosphorus. Um, if the microbes grow on it, then it can become a, um, it could take up extra phosphorus, but the pumice will eventually go to the bottom of the lake and that phosphorus will go to the bottom of the lake, but it doesn't necessarily stay there. So a lot of lakes turn over every year and um, microbes at the bottom of the lake can, um, so if all of that, so if you have phosphorus from the surface waters, right, it goes into the cells that are on the pumice. So that could be great temporarily. And then that pumice falls to the bottom of the lake. When it falls to the bottom of the lake, there's more microbes that chew on those other microbes, right, and can release that phosphorus. And when those lake waters mix, that phosphorus can come back to the surface waters. So it could be a temporary fix, but probably not a permanent one, um, unless you dredge out that sediment from the bottom, and that's usually a pretty expensive um, option. But yeah. Thank you. And our next question is coming from Facebook. Um, when it comes to fertilizing agricultural commodities, are there methods of fertilization that have shown to decrease the amount of nutrients that run off and remain in the soil? So are there methods of fertilization that? Um, that decrease the amount of nutrients um, that would remain in the soil and contribute to runoff. Right, yeah. So there's lots of really good um, recommendations on reducing runoff. One is like the time of fertilizer application, right? Are you adding the fertilizer when the plants need it? Or are you adding it in the fall when nothing's growing, potentially exposing it to um, rain events or things like that. So the timing of when you fertilize can really be important to keeping that fertilizer available to the plants that want it and not available to erosional forces. Um, cover crops can be really good too at keeping erosion rates down, again keeping that soil on the ground. Um, in some places, so uh, manure is a common fertilizer source, right? And instead of spreading the manure on the top of the soil, um, there's methods now where you can actually inject it into the soil. That seems to be a bit better. Um, although we're discovering that that actually might leach a bit more um, 
dissolved phosphorus instead of particulate phosphorus. So it's kind of complicated. Um, and to me, the best recommendation, right, is to only like, don't put on more fertilizer than you need, right? Get good soil testing done. Um, make sure that you're applying it to where it's needed, not where it's not needed, and to time that application right. And then to do things that minimize erosion. Um, a lot of erosion tends to happen on like certain parts of the field that are more, um, that just have poor quality for whatever reason. And so maybe, you know, maybe a good recommendation is to just like not farm that 5% of the land. Um, but of course that's not always um, a great, a great thing to say. Um, or can that can be a hard, a hard pill to swallow, but yeah. Great, thank you. Well, that looks like all, all, all the questions. Um, I just want to thank everyone for a great, a great evening and for your excellent questions. Um, and please uh, join me again in thanking uh, Jessica Corman for the fascinating presentation on Waters of the World and for answering all of our questions. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I guess clap again. <laughs> and um, I also want to say um, that uh, we really appreciate all of you tuning in tonight for Science Cafe and hope that you enjoy the virtual program. Um, and this particular program will be taking a brief break, but we'll be back with more presentations later this summer. Um, and so if you'd like to continue um, connecting with us virtually, we do have some other free programs coming up. Um, and so uh, just upcoming, you can find out about our programs on, um, <laughs> sorry, I hit a button. Um, you can find out about uh, our upcoming virtual programs at museum.unl.edu or on Facebook. Um, and so we are uh, holding virtual field trips every Tuesday. Our next one next week on June 2nd is called Who Lives Here? And we'll explore Morrow Hall's Cherish Nebraska exhibit and the creatures and terrains found in Nebraska. And we're also hosting our regular monthly programs such as Pop and Storytime, which will take place next week on Thursday, June 4th at 4 p.m. on Facebook Live. And to sign up for virtual field trips or to learn more about the programs, uh, please feel free to visit our website. So thank you all again for joining us. Um, and I hope that you have a great evening. Thank you again to uh, Jess for the great presentation and have a good night. <laughs>